Welcome everyone to M365 UK a special edition for uh, Microsoft Ignite after party. Uh, my name is Chirag Patel. I'm the organizer for M365 UK. This is the uh, 28th edition. It's been running for a couple of years. So I uh, just want to welcome everyone uh, to the uh, M365 UK. This is following on the back of Microsoft Ignite event we had back, uh, well, seems like a long time ago, but only a uh, few days ago. And so those are some of the pictures I took and, and I had a privilege to, to present with Chris and uh, Vescu uh, with the session at Microsoft Ignite on Enter the Mesh, which was all about the uh, mesh, uh, mesh for Teams. And we had a full house, so it was a very uh, kind of a, a table topic session uh, and also, you know, meeting all the community folks. So all the all the UK folks, so, you know, Manchester, which was where this event happened, uh, the regional uh, spotlight event. So uh, good turnout um, and also, you know, just to be there in person, really, and kind of attend few sessions uh, on the day. So today, uh, essentially, uh, a few of us, uh, we will uh, try and sort of, you know, share out uh, our thoughts, opinions, the, some of the announcement updates. And I'm pretty sure uh, for all of you, you've come across uh, in some ways in your own time. Uh, but it's, it's an opportunity to at least, uh, you know, to see what's going on and, and feel free to ask questions, uh, post questions in the, in the chat window. Uh, but essentially, slightly you, uh, different format in terms of how we do it uh, on a monthly basis. So a two hour session here today, uh, we kind of just have a quick intro in a second, uh, but really kind of just go through an hour or so uh, around the Ignite uh, announcements and updates. Uh, and then we will watch the session together uh, around the uh, Microsoft 365 governance covering various uh, workloads within that really. So uh, hopefully then we can go through the Q&A afterwards. So uh, at any point, just feel free to ask. Uh, and I also uh, would make a request uh, in the interest of uh, the spirit of community, just, you know, please respect uh, each other's opinions uh, and uh, generally just uh, behave good. So I'll come back to uh, Wildeg and others uh, to let them introduce themselves very quickly. Uh, but just for those of you who are new to M365 UK, uh, I'm, I'm Chirag, I work with Patel Consulting, uh, kind of work with M365 and various uh, workflows around deployments, migrations. So I'm also a trainer and deliver SharePoint and Viva courses, uh, as well as uh, kind of uh, organize and run M365 UK, as I mentioned, but also part of something what we call Viva Explorer, which is a kind of a group of MVPs uh, sharing all things uh, and organizing uh, an event that's coming up next month. Um, for if you're not already following M365 UK, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, M365 UK is the Twitter handle, hashtag, um, you know, Again, thank you for for those of you who are following and and really kind of you know sessions being recorded. So YouTube uh, channel is there for M365 UK, so you can feel free to access the previous uh, user group sessions we've had. So that's uh, enough about M365 UK there. Uh, but again, I mentioned Viva Explorers, uh, so we have an in-person event happening next month uh, on the 12th of November. Again, uh, you know, a full day of Viva All Things uh, sessions uh, from various UK MVPs uh, and a few from uh, Europe as well. And then, of course, to round up the year, uh, we got the European SharePoint uh, conference, uh, which again, you know, it's a kind of a, a great one to to attend if you haven't already attended before. <coughs> OK, so right, uh, let me introduce my uh, uh, panelists. So, you know, Valdek from Microsoft. Uh, I mean, you know, a, a lot of us, we know Valdek for many years, who was uh, MVP for many years, as well as, you know, kind of running, uh, you know, heading the product and Rancor, and then obviously now at Microsoft, helping developers really build the, the, the tools and everything else around Microsoft 365. Uh, Chris uh, Hold is uh, kind of, uh, you know, three-time MVP, but, it, you know, Super legend around in the, in the work that in the community does organizing and speaking and, and various community activities. Uh, Alexio Chandivana, uh, business application MVP um, uh, across Power Platform as well as other areas as well. So uh, we'll kind of hear from Alexio soon. And Sharon, you know, three time MVP uh, and double MVP, I should say, uh, in the M365 apps and services as well as the uh, business applications. And, and same for Paul Bullock as well uh, for double MVP in M365 apps and services as well as the 
N365 development. So over to you, Valdek, please introduce yourself uh, and then pass the baton on to Chris, Alexia, and so on. Definitely. Uh, great to meet you, everybody, even though I can only see five of you. It's great to be here. It's my first time in your community, so excited to be here. Um, as Chirag already said, I am, I can see six of you, excellent. <laughs> I am developer advocate at Microsoft for Microsoft 365, where we help developers understand what is it that we offer you on Microsoft 365 for developing apps. And that is really a really broad field, right? Because you go all the way from uh, extensions that show up inside Microsoft 365, all the way to standalone apps, web apps, desktop apps, mobile apps that you can build that tap into data and insights from Microsoft 365. So excited to be here and to talk to you today about the latest and greatest on Microsoft 365. I pass it on to Chirag, you mentioned? Chris. Chris. Thank you, brother. Hey, thanks very much, everyone. So my name is Chris Hoard. I'm part education lead uh, for Fusion here in the UK. I was the head of professional services and a field engineer for over a decade uh, before getting into this thing called uh, community. And uh, I still uh, have a, a passion for technical and, and working out how to do things. So that's the reason I, I stick around. And uh, and through that, I met Chirag and Sharon and uh, many others in this wonderful community. And uh, yeah, we, we, we get up to, we speak at events and um, uh, and uh, we push each other to kind of go further with the tech and that's what I really enjoy. And uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and then, uh, Chirac, are we moving on to next? Uh, Alexia. Alexia, thank you ever so awesome. much. My apologies. I do that, I do that so much. I, you know, I always forget. Thanks <laughs> yeah. very much, cheers. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hey everyone, yep, yeah, uh, pleased to be here. So Alexa Chandwana, uh, based in the UK, uh, business applications uh, MVP. So I mainly work uh, within the Dynamic 365 space and uh, I'm also very passionate about community uh, and uh, through community engagements, I came across Chirag uh, with some amazing Chirag. events and uh, looking forward uh, to be part of uh, this Ignite after party to talk about some of the new things which have come in into the Power Platform space and into the D D Dynamics area. And uh, for those of you who might want to have conversations in terms of how you can more or less uh, start leveraging those innovations. Please feel free to reach out. And uh, hey, looking forward to it. Uh, Sharon, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, Sharon Sumner, uh, Business Applications and M365 Apps and Services MVP. So um, I love Canvas apps. I love automation. I love SharePoint. Bit controversial. Um, <laughs> well, don't expect some support there. <laughs> and also um, anything that gets businesses to value faster. Um, so Microsoft Teams, massive advocate, playing with my new, you probably can't see it, my new Teams toy today. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, loving this community. Also run the Cambridge Power Platform User Group. So um, much to do in my spare time. Uh, love this community. Over to you, Paul. Great to have you, Sharon. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Paul Bullock, so I'm a, a, a two times, M, uh, sorry, three years and a bit MVP. I say a bit because it was a five day renewal for a lot of us <laughs> in between that gap. Um, uh, both in the um, Microsoft apps and services space and development. So I've been doing various projects around um, uh, migrations, you know, for work and things like that. Um, uh, and uh, helping people um, uh, it gets to know the tools, things like that, and and, and point them to this the, the ecosystem. So, um, as part of my uh, contributions and things like that, so what I I tend to do is uh, I, contrib I contribute quite heavily towards the Microsoft patterns and practices, and also part of the core team as well. Um, to uh, specifically around things like uh, PMP, PowerShell, the, the Core SDK, and it's to be fair, anything with with C sharp based development, because like, I'm I'm one of those people who who try to transition over to SharePoint framework, but never quite quite make it. So uh, uh, still doing that. And uh, one of my things that I own in that space is the uh, PMP script samples, which is a, a pretty cool repository of, of scripts that's growing quite quite nicely as well. Um, uh, so I'm quite 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 proud of that, as well as the being quite heavily involved with the modernization tooling, which is uh, which is awesome. 
So, um, yeah, so I'm a modern workplace architect in Avenard. So I've been doing that for uh, uh, I've, I've just across six months, actually. So um, and, and with uh, SharePoint and things like Azure and things like that. So I've been doing that for nearly 16 years. Azure 10, because I've seen it around 16 years. Um, so I've got uh, huge amounts of cloud experience and on-prem. Uh, I'm predominantly a SharePoint guy. Um, so <laughs> when, when SharePoint was yeah. mentioned, I was like, Ooh. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, um, I don't do too much with the Power Platform, but it is certainly a, a goal that I, I need to push on more and more. So, um, uh, a night's great this year. So, um, there's lots of things happening in multiple spaces. So, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing harder to, to keep up with the, the sort of latest yeah. tech and things like that and, and share that information internally as well, um, you know, to, to anybody who, who, who will listen. So, I don't. I need to get back into blogging a bit more, but uh, but certainly internally in Avenard, I uh, I do certainly re, re highlight new materials, things that come out, and and, and stuff like that to the to, sure. to build that community inside in the in the in the company and and further that. Great stuff. Now, thank you, Paul, and it'd be very great to have you. And I think yeah, I mean, I follow every one of you, and in, in terms of in various ways that you provide. So yeah, I think just for the audience. You know, we don't get paid for these things. So, you know, all of you, including you know, all of us, we take our time out just to kind of make sure that, you know, you get what you want. So, uh, you know, yeah, like I mentioned before, you know, just ask the questions uh, or post it on the chat window, whichever you prefer. Uh, but we got welding just for a short time because as we can appreciate, you know, uh, busy man he is. So I think if I can start with you, uh, well, they kind of obviously, you know, being at Microsoft, uh, and, and by the way, I think, you know, please all respect our NDAs <laughs> around this because it can be a bit slippery. Uh, but yeah, what, what kind of what are the key highlights for you? Uh, certainly from, you know, from a development perspective, uh, that's kind of caught your attention that what you're super proud of. How many am I allowed to pick and how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can say as, as long as you want. Keep going. <laughs> well, so for one, right? Like the one cool thing is about which we talk is the ability to build apps for our for teams and then have the same apps appear in Outlook and the new Microsoft 365 app, right? So that gives you the ability to really bring your app where users are, as opposed to have them look around for where was this app and how can I get info about X. Now these apps can appear where they they they're, they already are without any additional investments. Like you as a dev build the app once and you benefit from all the different locations where you can expose the same app. So that is one. Two, what was really cool is the new APIs for teams where you can even get even more access to the info from teams like a transcript. Right, like or um, um, other things, which, which 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 allows you to build really cool apps on top of that. Run some kind of analysis, like who's talking for what. Maybe I am spending too much time talking and don't give, don't leave enough uh, air in the room for everyone else. Right. So these are really the cool kind of things uh, you can build on top of that because now you have the access to who said what during a meeting. Right. Right. So that is also cool. Um, and then another one is. Uh, the GA of the Teams toolkit, right, which is probably the fastest way for you to build a Teams app, right? It, it not only it it allows you to um, easily create a new app, but also like when you press F5, you'll see you 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 you'll be able to see that app immediately in Teams without having to manually package, deploy, hook things up, and set up tunneling yeah. and all of that. Like if you've worked with development for Teams in the past, you will appreciate it even more. If you're new to it, things just work. You press F5 and your app works. So this is just like top of my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I only allowed to pick a few, not to you know steal under from, yeah, from no, no. everyone no. else, I, I like, that'll ask. be my like top three uh, yeah. announcements. No, no, that's good. What I was going to quickly ask on that the the Teams toolkit is that now part of, if I read it correctly, part of Visual Studio, um, in terms of where you can create solutions. Correct. So there are actually two types, right? So there is the extension for VS Code, right. which allows you to build Teams apps with JavaScript and TypeScript. And then you can use C Sharp with Team to Teams Toolkit for VS, right? So depending which language you want to use, you will use either one. They're both okay. free. So like at the end of the day, it comes to uh, your preference and skills, which one you want to use. Right, right. I'm with you. Okay. 
Uh, Chris, what about yourself? Uh, from a, I guess you know, since we're talking about teams, I guess because pretty much that's what we do these days, don't we? <laughs> uh, what's your what's your highlight? What, what's your what's your views on that? Well, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough because there, there there was a lot for teams that this time around, and um, it's kind of strange because there was a lot announced, but we're getting used to this idea that kind of new announcements for teams are happening mm -hmm. all year long. Um, <clears throat> you know, they've happened. There was a lot at uh, Inspire. There was a lot of build, and and there, there was a lot at Ignite. I mean, I guess for me, if the, the the biggest thing was probably what we we talked about in terms of the avatars you know for for for, for mesh for microsoft teams and that's because you know it's finally coming to fruition so when when it was announced at ignite it's announced that they're now in private preview and mm. as we know from the cadence with microsoft teams they're in private and now move to public preview and then you know it will go ga yeah. Uh, and from our session, you know, for many people, that will be the first time that they use kind of metaverse within a business context. Uh, there we have one. There's Sharon, you know. There's Sharon. Sharon. Hello, Sharon. Sharon. You know, <laughs> Tapton and, and uh, you know, we're going to we're going to do this and, and, and do all of those actions yeah. that we can do. But it, it's going to really, I think, you know, kind of change the way that and, and from what we saw at that event, there was a very kind of spectral reaction to it. Some yeah. people love it and it's a big opportunity for them some people hate it and you know what there's going to be an opportunity there too so you know we're going to enter a kind of a, a new stage of really i think personalization is going to help you know and really define identity in terms of the meaning you know we're in and it's gonna it's gonna be a big topic a conversation in our organization so in terms of i'm i'm particularly interested in it from a kind of from a change perspective things that really change how we do things so that that yeah. was a particular one for me which was the the, the mesh avatars but you know since i work with Vesco and yourself yeah. and others uh, I, I think that's probably a, an expe expected answer yeah and it's kind of been a long time isn't it because i think it was announced back about last year wasn't it uh sometime november kind of uh, well 21 thereabouts it's been felt like a long time coming just to come in like a private preview if you like um it Exactly, and there were several starts and 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 kind of like false dawns leading up to that period. I mean, you know, when when we had, if we if we think about, you know, that 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 event with Alex Kipman and he was standing and showing what the metaverse was capable of. I mean, that was a kind of in IT world that was a long time ago from now, and the fact that we're kind of almost there, and 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 we know what's going to happen from this point. Mm. So we're going to see the introduction of avatars, and and then we're going to see immersive meetings, and and then you know we're going to go on to potentially see you know the kind of the the building of worlds within that. But also sure. as well, it's not just about kind of you know metaverse. It's not just about VR. You know, it's also about augmented and mixed reality as well. Yeah. And you know, when when we come from the teams world, it, it, we always think that you know that that a is to do with VR and, and and then it's to do with meta. I mean, Microsoft have this whole industrial metaverse piece on that, you know, with digital mm -hmm. twins, for example, building on Azure. And so, you know, there's going to be this industrial metaverse and commercial metaverse that augments what they're already doing um, with with alt space VR within the uh, within the personal space. So we're not just going to see it thrust forward from a team's level. We're going to see metaverse come across all of Microsoft's ecosystems over the course of next year. And and this is really just an, an ingress for many people to get started. Yeah. Sure. Well, Dick, if I come back to you um, with regards to Teams Premium that was announced. Now, I know that's obviously, you know, that's going to come out sometimes end of this year in terms of preview, right? But there's a lot of stuff what's been announced. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, just from your perspective, especially from a development perspective, how much of that, especially I think, for example, like the meeting guides uh, or, you know, templates branding the meeting experience, for example. And obviously I appreciate, you know, you probably don't even have enough <laughs> details around that, but how much do you think, given that there's a lot of focus on the apps development from, like you mentioned earlier, and given the, you know, the hybrid uh, work experience and everything else that goes on and with the premium, how much of that from a development perspective, it's going to be a, a game changer, I guess. I think there's an, there's an interesting part, right? Because like it's twofold. Like it's one is the developer experience, 
And the other one is what will land in practice in a field, the customers and where the demand will be. And I think we are early on and I think we are, we're yet to see both of these uh, um, advance. So right now it's yet to be seen, I guess. Yeah. Okay, okay. Alexia, if I can come to you and, and maybe Sharon as well on this one from uh, integration points, was there anything that caught your attention there between Teams and Power Platform side of things that you may I like? Go on, Sharon. <laughs> Sorry, just playing with her. Um, no, so the on the Power Platform side, there was actually some uh, kind of lesser, I guess, um, announcements. Uh, I think some of the focus, like uh, Chris has already said, was on some of the Teams functionality, and there were definitely some important Azure announcements. But um, the ability to have uh, managed environments, for example, in Power Platform, for those of us who come from a a SharePoint, I feel difficult because she's not following my hands. My hands are quite expressive. Um, so, <laughs> feedback, <sorry>. feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the uh, within SharePoint, we've had SharePoint sprawl for years and the same sort of happened in the Power Platform in that we got to um, usability and to end users because it's low code, you know, the, the spread happened really quickly. So a bit of a pullback on those governance things is really important. So I think managed environments was a key one for me. Um, and also then assisting with uh, some of the stuff that we all love to do, like date functions and, um, you know, the complex regex stuff where we can type it in in plain language and it will translate it for us. That's superb. Lots of people mm -hmm. loving that. You know, there was more search functionality added. Brilliant. Love that. Uh, Help you replace anything in a in a detailed expression quickly mm -hmm. across the power app or, you know, uh, in deep in deep in flows and that kind of stuff. So some that they, they seem like minor improvements, but they're actually quite impactful on the power platform. Yeah. I thought. Alexia, how about yourself with the dynamics? I think something I, uh, I read about was um, the business central for any Teams users, you pretty much have a free access without the need for even having a license. Um, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you get that? No. Maybe tell us a bit more about that if you can. Yeah, so with uh, Business Central, uh, what that means, uh, an Office 365 user who's licensed will have uh, read access uh, to Business Central data. But uh, the key highlight uh, for me was uh, within Power Automate. Uh, because uh, every organization now, every user, we're looking to automate some of our processes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the challenges uh, many face is where to actually get started. So the addition of uh, AI and natural language uh, to Power Automate, where you can describe that automation uh, you're looking to achieve, uh, and then the AI builds uh, that uh, Power Automate, then the user has now the ability to select uh, the flow uh, they need to use in the connectors. So I think uh, that's a game changer. So that feature is now uh, in preview. And uh, for many of us, uh, Canvas apps, model driven apps, you're busy building your app, right? The last thing you want is uh, someone jumping in there and uh, mess up what you're working on. You now have the ability to work uh, co offering uh, within apps uh, now. So you can also tag your colleagues you're working with, and that means there's no interference uh, in what uh, you're actually building. So again, it's not just uh, the whole core offering part of it, but I think we are bringing everyone together. So whether it's a project, it's a department you're working on, everyone is together. And in some cases, one might have a better skill than the other. So everyone can learn from each other because you're all working in the same area. So I think that's a big plus for me. Now that's pretty good. And I think just to kind of, I guess, add to that is also I think what's probably rolling out now uh, or maybe soon uh, is the embedded Microsoft Teams chat within Dynamics, isn't it? So having to, instead of step out and go into Teams or something, that, that experience is kind of coming in Dynamics. So probably that probably helps a lot, especially linking the chats with the uh, customer record, right? Yeah, so I will also say uh, from a Dynamics uh, point of view, uh, another bonus uh, which is mainly rolling out now uh, for our sales colleagues uh, is Viva Sales. So you now have the ability for a salesperson 
to now transcribe some of uh, these interactions mm -hmm. uh, and then you are now associating those things uh, with the records you might have in dynamics so it's saving a lot of uh, time uh, for organizations to sit down on there for a salesperson to write things down to put them there the phone call is done they can transcribe that conversation and kind of gain some more uh, insights and make strategic decisions uh, in terms of how they go forward in terms where there's a lead or an opportunity yeah no that's good and i think uh, if i can maybe come back to to Velda just before i let you go i guess because uh, i know you need to get off in a few minutes so uh just from a from a team's future perspective i know there's the roadmap is obviously as ever always being refreshed and constantly you know things added probably less items being retired or cancelled <laughs> uh, but just give us a, a food of a thought i guess in terms of what do you see 2023 um, happening uh, from your point well, of view for for one i think we will see more demand demand around apps for for teams right because over the last few years we've seen the the adoption curve went through the roof right we've seen a lot of companies having to go through some being forced some being planned to having to go to hybrid work and they had to adopt teams they adopted teams right and it's not as simple as it might seem like well you have now this tool and you can chat with everybody and call and like that's trivial tr 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 to um, some of us, but it's not as simple for everyone, right? Where we have a big org and that adoption takes time. And I think that what, what we will see in the next year, the calendar year, is that maturity will will increase and companies will start looking for, okay, we have, we have teams, we've adopted it, we know our way around it, we use it. What else can we do with that? And I think the mm, discussions around uh, extending apps for teams, bringing your existing apps into teams mm -hmm. and also bring teams into your existing apps because it, it works two ways, right? Yeah. The same way you can ex expose your LOB app inside teams where people already work. You might just as well want to have a scenario like imagine that you are a bank and you want to offer a way for the customers to be able to uh, have a call with somebody and you want to have a branded experience so that, that the customers don't need to, I don't know, get on teams, right? You want to, you want to host that experience for, for them and you can do that. You can expose teams through ACS to the customers, right? So, so I think we will see more of that. We will see more ingrained thinking around bringing business into teams, as well as bringing teams into apps where users are uh, already in, so that we all can work more efficiently and effectively. Yeah, yeah just, to, just, to, just to build on, 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 on that point there, you know, when if we go and go back to build and they were talking about the SDK too, and I, I feel like that got lost a little bit in the kind of in the conversation and in the conference because it's all about kind of bringing the apps into different surfaces. And, and if we think about an, an app, you know, the communities, yeah, Beaver Engage, you know, that's a good one. And one of the first things that I do in the morning when I get in the morning is I go to Outlook and I do Outlook because I do my personal emails and now I can access the Viva Engage app directly out of Outlook. When mm -hmm. I switch into Microsoft Teams, I can also access the Viva Engage uh, Outlook out, you know, so th there's this idea that surfaces is very important and that you can access that app within the context of the surface. You know, I, I just love that piece mm -hmm. because yeah. it's it's what Microsoft turn in the flow of work. You know, it, people think the flow of work is like almost like a linear fashion going A, B, C, yeah. D, and E. It's not in the flow of work is this is a, you can access things when you need it at any point, whether you're in the browser or in Teams or in Outlook, it doesn't matter. Even in the in the mic the new Microsoft 365 app, there's going to be a progressive web app straight mm. off the taskbar and you can get into engage that way that that is just you know you can use it in any context you're working in it's uh, it's fantastic good point no it's, it is it is a good point i think and especially the microsoft 365 apps extending from where we are from office apps to a new app so uh it's a good one i think so well then look i think thank you I very much for, yeah. for joining <laughs> us and look you know all the best see you in the community somewhere uh, but for others, please stay on. And uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Valdek. Have a good one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. So I think if I turn around to the audience, uh, anyone, uh, and 
please feel free to unmute um, and just ask uh, anything that you think that you know that you saw that was of interest to you or to your organization then you know i'd love to love to hear from you um so yeah uh, feel free anyone so russell did mention in chat shirak that co-authoring uh, was the highlight so managing the, the team better. Uh, again, that's one that we've seen talked about for quite some time. So um, when it lands, you're like, oh, great, that's here. <laughs> um, but actually, that is really important, right? Yeah, yeah. It, so I think the, well, the core three, I mean, I guess we're referring to the, the power platform, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, especially coding, yeah. But again, I think that whole collaboration piece, and I know especially you know, with Jeff Tipper and, and all the focus around now, you know, with all the mixture of services uh, where collaboration. So even like, you know, it's not about SharePoint governance or or Power Platform governance, even though we do have the COE and the Center of Excellence kind of uh, some updates around that. But it's that whole piece of collaboration governance, right? Around I think, you know, teamwork for Hub and altering together and whatever it is, what environment, whatever spaces you're in. Um, yeah, uh, but it, it, it's also about as well, Chirag. I mean, the the kind of the pragmaticness of it. You know that that, yeah. that, that co-authoring allows, um, you know, people to, you know, if we if we, I think we've all been in you know IT a long time, and we all meant you know kind of remember the day with file servers and somebody's accessed the document and it locks the other person out, and you know you'd have to, and you wouldn't know in large organisations mm. who that was. And so, you know, these things like co-authoring and time saving and being able to do multiple things at once are, are really important things. And and some of the nuggets throughout all these events really help us to to kind of do things better. I mean, if we've uh, a good a good example is Microsoft Places. So the Microsoft mm -hmm. Places app, you're going to be able to coordinate, for example, the hot desking is a big part of that. If you know, you know, in your week who's going to be in your office in hybrid working at any one time and you can see that all laid out and accessible at any time that's going to make us kind of work in a much more efficient way than we did previously and there's lots of stuff like that throughout you know there's a you know microsoft editor and bonding microsoft editor with ai to help you self correct the changes in your writing mm -hmm. without the time burden of going back and creating you know having to correct the document manually mm -hmm. These will help us do things faster, make things easier. And I think that's just a really important thing. So, you know, the, it's why the mesh, you know, kind of av avatar, for example, I think got part of a, a spectral yeah. reaction because, you know, some people can't associate with how that makes our life easier, better, faster, you know, kind of thing. And and and, and whereas there's lots of things in Ignite that help us to do that. So, uh, yeah. It's, interesting. Uh, it's interesting. So Paul, being yes. from, yeah, what's your what's your views? I and mean, I think there's probably a lot to cover for yourself, anyways. <laughs> but come on, let's hear it. Yeah, there's there was a few things that caught my eye at night. Um, the big one is for me anyway was Microsoft Syntax. So um, mm. I do a lot of work around migrations uh, and and moving people to 365 and and elements of governance and things like that. And there's going to come a point where um you know there, there isn't many people left to move to 365 you know there's that there's it's more about tenant tenant migrations moving stuff around and it's taking clients to the next level and it's like now you've got your your content and your services in 365 what can you do with it next and i i uh, syntax is one of those things where i looked at it at the beginning and i thought okay that's that's great for document processing and uh, and using that intelligence to to draw out that that information from unstructured data, and then um, you sort of one of those things where you sort of close your eyes for a second, and come back, and like, whoa, it's just suddenly gone explosive with with the amount of functionality that's suddenly um, been introduced to that, and the fact that it it originally was SharePoint syntax that so has been expanded to to the other areas. So, for example, Azure and uh, the Power Platform now can utilize that. And I was watching a recording around uh, the AI Builder. Um, with um, document management and how you can do certain things with that. And I thought that looks like syntax. And it was only when I watched the other recording around syntax, I'm like, all oh, right, OK, do you know what that is? <laughs> that makes total sense now. It is, it is, it is, it is syntax. And yeah. it's not just about that sort of document 
um, you know, the extraction of that um, uh, yeah, content. It's also from dealing with the unstructured data. data as well, right? As in that well, map. well, exactly. Yeah, you know, there's so much of it. I mean, there was there was a figure that, that Jeff um, put on the screen. Something like we generate like 1.6 billion documents a day, and that's like that's an insane amount of content that, that's going into the platform being generated by by yeah. by the users and and various systems and things like that and and it's obviously trying to draw out that that value from from those from that that, that, that content um but it's not just that it's it they, they've they've altered syntax in a way where especially on a sharepoint side where now you can you can use um an azure subscription uh to manage some of the aspects of it so it's not just a you buy a license and you have to buy a license for every user that interacts with the syntax libraries but you can also use an azure subscription mm. much like the power platform has done with with that where you can we can uh, change that chargeability model which i think will appeal to quite a few customers yeah um where where, where they're not have the avatar do i want to spend fifty thousand? licenses on on this or do i use a more of a consumption model where people use it so that was that was pretty cool but it also bundles in things like archiving and backup which is the two things i encounter a lot with uh migrations is, is yeah. people want to keep the stuff they have to potentially for um you know work around public sector and sort of highly regulated industry so they have to keep content for a certain period of time you know gdpr and uh, records act and things like that ha have to kick in and, and they have to keep content for a period of time yes there is record management but there are going to be cases where you just want to silo off that content yeah. that you want to keep for a bit it needs to play out retention but no one yeah. really accesses on, on a long term and, and that is that is that is bundles part of syntax uh, which was which was quite interesting yeah. Uh, yeah. to hear is, that, that that could be it keeps your environment clean really so well, rather than you have right. But, but it's like, also like sort of slicing out, isn't it? In a sense that it's not just about content generation and then being able to kind of smarten that up, right? And being able yeah. to extract that meaningful, but like you say about the backup and archiving. I think it was also interesting just to just on that point uh, around that content generation is something that was announced again at Ignite, which is, you know, the introduction to the Microsoft Sustainability Manager, right? So it's all about how many documents we're generating, you know, mail, email, files, whatever, right? So there is obviously something in M365, right? And it's like a the dashboard, right? Environmental impact dashboard, which you can actually kind of record. And this is GA, right? Uh, and I've yet to use it, I must say that. But it's, it's an ability to be able to at least calculate the impact you're having on the environment, right? Based on all this content generation. So not just from an intelligence perspective to make use of your your content and capitalizing on that using Microsoft syntax. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, do you need all that data? Right. And uh, I think, exactly. And I think, Chirag, you know, and to build upon, you know, what, what Paul was saying, you know, for the last 15 years, you know, we, we've been doing this, this digital transformation and getting, you know, you're seeing this, this big on-premise move to the cloud. I think that the next 15 years is 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 going to be, you know, a lot to do with custodianship and getting mm. people to have value. Uh, and data is a big thing. What what Weldick was talking about with apps, getting the apps in the right places for people to be able to make the most of it, help people to work together, manage mm. the data efficiently. I mean, these are all things, you know, to make the most out of the cloud services as opposed to getting people to use them. Yeah, um, we had a hand up uh, from uh, Russell. Uh, Russell, did you have a question or some input? Oh yeah, but it wasn't about the Microsoft syntax. Uh, I was actually coming to pick on the, um, you know, the cards, the modern cards that have been introduced. You know, we have a lot of apps doing business processes and other things that uh, a lot of organizations have, but if we don't design the experience very well, it could just be a white elephant in the environment that they don't wouldn't be using. And um, adoption is also an issue, especially with this, um, with, with the apps and other things that we are really known to customers. So I was really happy when I noticed that um, uh, the custom and power apps, how we can easily design them. So what came to mind is how I can even use the apps that we already have right now, remodel them into card interaction so that from teams you can have access to any other app these micro apps easily 
so that uh, usability will be very good, accessibility will be very good, and uh, they would have, they'd have to be jumping from one app to the other. No, everything can be on Teams. So I, I was really intrigued that this is going to be in general availability very soon, and also push it out to um, the current apps that I'm using. So that with the co train and also um, Azure Cognitive Services, we have some new two services. The version 4.0 of the image analysis. I'm actually yet to try it because um, we have some projects in that line that yeah. I will be considering very soon. So I was really happy that the the drawbacks of version 3.0 are going to be worked on. So a lot of exciting nice. things that I'm looking forward to. That's, that's good, Russell. And I think if I could maybe just pick up on on just that one, just to extend that, I think what why I also came across something is called um, the Azure Form Recognizer. So similar to to Syntax, you know, in terms of kind of capturing the key key pieces of data. So you got something here, which I believe I think is part of Azure Cognitive Services, the Azure Form Recognizer. So it's in preview right now, but it's it's basically you know kind of it includes with all the pre built AI model, right? So automatically extracting uh, the content from contracts and any of the documents. So when you compare that piece of service yeah. against yeah. Microsoft syntax, there is still that question: what's what's under the bonnet, so to speak, right? In terms of what's been used. Um, and so as a as an organization, if you've got all that bucket load of data in file shares or or wherever then which one would you want to use syntax or azure form recognizer obviously azure form recognizer is is kind of scoped for specific purposes but the options are there right in order to kind of uh, to use by that so yeah i mean that's kind of really just really going up in terms of which solution options you use so thank you for that russell yeah i, I mean i guess from i mean a couple of things that, which i picked up around um, just looking at slightly outside of M3, uh, you know, M365 services sort of things is the uh, the edge, uh, you know, so I don't know if you came across uh, yourselves here, but, you know, things like uh, being able to share uh, a set of links or files, links or whichever to to your teams, right, inside kind of Microsoft Edge uh, in terms of that workspaces, which is in preview. Um, so basically, yeah, sharing a set of browser tabs, which I know we all store links and favorites and all these things, right? So I thought that was probably a, a bit of a nice end user for me, I think, in terms of picking that up, uh, but also being able to search for things, right? You know, just in the address bar, which I think Google Chrome probably does it anyway, depending on your choice of the browser, right? But being able to type in the, you know, the weather details for a particular location, and it just drops the result straight in that address bar. I think little kind of gems to, uh, like that kind of really makes uh, a good big difference around the productivity side of things. Um, OK, so I guess from uh, Sharon and, uh, and, and Chris, of course, I think, you know, like, you know, because I know you, you both kind of have done some sessions together or at least moderated, you know, especially looking at the mesh for after. And I know one of the things I picked up in one of the sessions is, is how you kind of, you know, how Ignite presented the perspectives on metaverse, which is around not just from that consumerism, right, but also the commercial and the industrial metaverse, right? I thought that was quite, quite a nice way to sort of put in perspective in for organizations how they want to go into uh, you know just to kind of make it work for their organization do, do you have any kind of um, thoughts or what did it make of it in terms of uh, for that particular area I think Chris has got some really interesting thoughts um, there was a, a session with that. <laughs> that I moderated for Chris that scared the hell out of me but <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I mean, that's more about kind of um, somebody said it earlier, their avatar doesn't look anything like them. Um, those kind of issues around. I mean, um, I, I sit here right now because she's not following me. You don't know whether I'm paying attention or not. Um, you know, you, you're not getting real expressions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's as much as I can sit here and pick from the very big list. Um, I think commercially there are pros and cons. But I think as with anything where we anonymize, um we've got to be careful right mm -hmm. 
Chris, go for it. <laughs> no, you <laughs> won't. For, for, for unload. Um, no, no, I mean, it, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting. I mean, I, I think that you know, there's got to be a very real conversation, and that conversation starts with all different perspectives without trying to pigeonhole people or, or call them bigots. You know, when after I had my um, Microsoft Ignite session with with you, Chirac, I was at um, South Coast Summit, so I was like physically in a place, uh, and and Laurie, who's the head of the, the team's MVPs, was there, and and she came into the room, was like, Chris, they all want to kind of meet you. Um, you know, afterwards, they want to see you, they want to talk to you in person. And I'm like, great. So I walk into this room and the first people, you know, the first thing somebody said is, oh, that's disappointing. You know, you know, you know, you know from, from, from looking at your nicely preened avatar to, and I'm like, oh, thanks, you know. So, um, and there were some people that, that absolutely loved it and they're all in on it. And there's some people that absolutely hate it. And they think that, it's really trivializing business and you know it's catfishing and it's making you something you're not i mean yeah. the, the thing about the metaverse is, is that it, it, what it does generally speaking is that for most it evokes strong opinions and, and strong emotions and people come to it with all of their biases but we have to think about you know the the kind of the future and the fact that this came along before and it came along before with the internet mm -hmm. and mobile phones and emojis and all this other stuff that you know there, there were people that were saying no back then no to emojis you know mm -hmm. i remember the first time i used a, uh, an emoji to my cfo he literally walked around to my desk and was like i don't want to see no you know kind of illustrations or you know that 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 isn't business that isn't what business is and and you know what he, he drops in emojis all the time in his email now so he's kind of changed yeah. and, and rolled with the times and stuff like that and we've got to think about the younger generation that's coming into the workforce you know the these young people that spend like half of their weekends in Fortnite, and that's going to be the expectation over what business yeah. is and how yeah. we work in the future uh, and that's normalized to these people. They come in, they expect to have a mobile, use mobile, use apps, work and and, and work as if they were gaming. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, you know, it, it's not something as if we have any kind of control over it. It is going to happen. And it's just going to happen, yeah. But yeah. Those, those kind of calling it out is still really important. I mean, as Sharon said, we did a session at Metaverse One last month and we looked you know, into the ethics of it. And some of it is absolutely mm -hmm. creepy, you know, and some of it, you know, they think of, you know, Roblox where, you know, yeah. there was a hidden section with gas chambers and a Nazi concentration camp. And that, and you know, and Roblox is for children, you know, in a met, like kind of Metaverse environment for children. So, having the people that are very want to wail on metaverse and stuff like that and and organizations like like microsoft and and meta who who want to go into this area is is all well and good in terms mm -hmm. of you know i think most people add to the conversation to it's like ai you know there's a lot you know there's a big portion that's negative around ai but we use it all the time in microsoft 365 we use it in editor we use it in powerpoint you know people don't even realize every day they use ai if they use microsoft 365 and guess what it's that ai that's saving them from security issues in mm. things like azure you know I, I, I identity protection so I think the metaverse is going to be like this and I love the fact that it's so heated a debate and I love to 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 kind of have a conversation on it. Sure. Now that's that's, that's interesting. So I'm just looking through the chat. I know there's some interesting comments and I, and and I thanks to all and real quick share of the uh, of the presenter plus. Here it is. Ah, cool. Yes. <laughs> so it arrived by UPS today. It's like one nice. day old, I think. <laughs> um it's kind of cool. It's got to, I, I would press it but it it's a mute button, <laughs> right? You don't like that one. Um, but if you do um, PowerPoint, um, what's it called when it's when it's in here? Um, PowerPoint Live. Thank PowerPoint you. Live. Yeah. PowerPoint Live. So if you switch, and and I didn't even notice that PowerPoint Live, uh, the present in Teams, is now right at the top of there too, which is really nice. So you go straight into Teams, and you have the forward, backwards, and you have a nice little pointer. Yeah. Oh, um, cool. One thing that I think is super cool for me is that I tend to, when I'm having a conversation with somebody, I go off onto a million other windows. So it's not the, the main use of it, but the little Teams button that you have there, that's all lit up at the moment, um, it takes you back 
to the conversation that you're in. So it opens teams within context, but it will also dangerously join the next meeting for you when one is due. Now, ah. if you're anything like me, there are three simultaneous meetings in most time slots. <laughs> I'm not quite sure well, how it's going to pick. I don't know. <laughs> we'll that's see. interesting. That's interesting. I mean, certainly that, that does look a real smart device, doesn't it? I think it's certainly. Really, I think, tiny. Yeah, right? really tiny. It just sort of fits in really nice. <laughs> no, yeah. thanks for that, Sharon. That's cool. That, nice little nugget. That I, I like that one. I, I, I think I sourced a few pictures today as well on Twitter. I think uh, I'm quite tempted as well. I think I think Sarah Sarah's probably done a quick blog. There's a blog already. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Comparing it with all over it. Others. <laughs> yeah. So okay, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure I'll get my hands on it. Like you know, like a lot of us there. Um, I'm just going through some comments very quickly before we head over to the uh, the watching. But I think there was one interesting. I think Satish uh, mentioned about which is true. The Teams mobile phone, you know, that went GA or formerly it was known as Operator Connect, um, and then Cisco you know, devices by default will obviously, uh, you know, that's the partnership still, you know, from Microsoft Teams and. So yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff happening in, in the calling and obviously you know with the time that we have here, it's almost impossible to to cover it <laughs> to, to that. So there's there's a lot of stuff happening, uh, the, the call side of things and the devices. Uh, so that's great stuff to look for. What I wanted to also touch very quickly, I know we haven't mentioned Viva, and I think for those of you who, who you know, especially the attendees, I think uh, you know the whole you know the whole side of things around employee experience uh, you know and again it's all about how much you re in, in my view how much you care about the employees for your organization so i know on september 22nd there was a lot of announcements made in terms of you know what the viva is going to look like and what's coming our way but certainly a few things went uh, you know some a few things are in private preview uh, viva engage i think chris mentioned earlier regarding the interface between outlook and teams so viva engage storyline that went ga so that's pretty much having your own kind of posts and uh, all the all the content so that you know anybody can share and all that be it teams or outlook and then obviously stories which will be an ability to add your photos and and all the other variety of content making it more richer so that will be part of your storyline itself so that whole experience uh, and you know one can compare with old SharePoint folks, if I can use that term, you know, might compare with newsfeed, right? But this is a lot more better uh, and especially with Yammer. So, you know, Yammer is definitely there, uh, like it or not, whether you're large or small organization, you definitely need Viva Engage if you really want to keep your people together, right? So I think that for me was quite a quite a big one, especially in the speed of how that was announced and how much kind of it's come through to GA. So that was that was quite good. Viva goals, I think that's another one that's kind of really uh, kind of racing fast because especially with all the, you know, the integrations that you have and the story around that, I mean, especially with with third party, you know, like Slack and Google Sheets, you know, that's all, you know, and that's there. Jira on Prime is coming soon. Uh, and then obviously with Microsoft own apps, you know, you've got the Azure DevOps and Power BI, Dynamics, Planner. Uh, project so all that is going to really make Viva goals uh, a lot more kind of richer to at least measure you know the, your key results and and everything else around that but I think planner was quite interesting just since I mentioned planner is the planner APIs I think that was that's hugely awaited isn't it in terms of <laughs> to to try and get hands on on planner and make it work and I think I can see you know, yeah the reaction there I saw the reaction on social media too I think it's it was a big, big thumbs up. Uh, any, any thoughts, uh, Paul, on that, or, or Chris, or, or anybody, I guess, for that matter? Well, that was. Uh, well, I think it might even enable things like my tenant to tenant migrations of planner uh, plans. Actually, um, I, I, it's something that I haven't touched too much on, but, uh, but mm -hmm. certainly, certainly, I, I feel like it would open up that that space as well. Um, I can see, I can see that the. Uh, potentially the planner stuff would get baked into the PMP tooling, uh, you know, the CLI mm -hmm. for Microsoft 365 or PMP PowerShell certainly, uh, I suspect, will will include that capability very shortly. Um, 
there's loads average. of improvement coming there i think paul because they yeah. you know we deploy plans from a template at the moment but it's you know the old-fashioned iterate through until you get to the bottom and then start again you know it's not yeah. not been a graceful api experience for automation i don't think so really looking forward to that getting better and i think project for the web doesn't get kind of enough press around this it is a, a step between planner and uh, full-blown project um, and there's some really nice stuff in there at the moment and it's it's coming on really really fast in terms of delivery of features so that's also one to watch I think if you're a planner fan. Yeah that is good you're absolutely right I couldn't agree more I think especially the, the project and I think it's probably the, the, the bit of a story around that you know in terms of everyone associates with Microsoft project right and project for web but it is a subscription base isn't it and therefore you have all these competitive experiences in, in terms of the way we do the work, right? So you got your DevOps and you got your planner and then you obviously got Jira. So there is guess, from my <laughs> point of view, it, it put the data in Dataverse. So we're happy. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we I mean, can now build our own apps. There you go. <laughs> there's so many conflicting things on that. I mean tasks I think has to be the one thing that mm. you know there's so many apps around it you've got to do and you've got planner and yeah um you know yeah. I, I I use Azure DevOps now you know given uh you know kind of pretty much more than anything else particularly with the, the kind of replication of boards inside the environment and then I know people that use lists um you know for yeah. tasks as well at the same time and people that, that, that I, I i know that even use sharepoint you know to store it almost as items with inside them <laughs> again it goes back to that kind of idea of, of, of what i think many of us were saying you know paul and, and, and i know sharon's a big part of this as well but anyone over the power platform side is really kind of that simplification and making it kind of work for people in mm. all of the aspects. I think that's what the next kind of few years is uh, definitely going to be about. It does come back to the integration story, doesn't it? It's the, the fact that everything is integrated, everything's available with the Graph API and the data is stored in a consistent place, you mm. know? So it just makes it easier for all of us to be able to leverage the tool set, I think. Yes, it's, it's always going back to when to use what, isn't it? <laughs> it just changes every other week. As long as they're all <laughs> using the same technology, I think then it, it becomes preference, right? I think Chris is right. People have been um, holding on to running tasks in Outlook because that's the way they love to do it, or they do it as, you know, it's so many different apps. Well, as long as they're in the same technology under the hood, mm -hmm. you knock yourself out, use the one you like. <laughs> yeah, I think the one I wanted to pick up quickly on was Microsoft Loop. I think that's been around in terms of how much, you know, especially that's in private preview, the, the Loop app. Uh, and for those of you who, who might not be that familiar, so being able to kind of just work on the content wherever you are and, and kind of pick up as you go and update that. So that's, you know, in form of the workspaces, the pages and the components. So paragraph in Word or Teams, wherever it is, table, bullet points, all kind of carries with you wherever you are. Uh, so that's like another one, isn't it, in terms of that integration story, right, to to kind of add to that. But I think what really caught my attention there was uh, the sensitivity labels um, and the uh, the DLP for loop components, which hopefully will be available in a GA by end of the year. So that's always that's the one that's always kind of even like since this announcement thinking, you know, where does this data live? Where does it reside? Who can access that data? So I think I'm quite interested and I know we haven't, to be honest with you, I think today uh, we didn't really cover that much on security and, and compliance and there's, there's obviously a lots and lots of announcement there. But I think from a productivity perspective, I think this one is will be very interesting for Loop App and uh, in terms of how it handles the sensitivity labels and still being able to, you know, retain your, your policies, what you have uh, inside of security and compliance. So I think, yeah, that was a... That was an interesting one. The the, the loop app is going to literally, you know, I think we'll see a lot more takeoff of uh, loop apps. I mean, because the, you know, as everyone knows, loop is, is kind of broken down into three parts. You've got the components, the pages and the actual loop app itself or the, or the workspaces, shall we say, that's contained within the loop app. Mm -hmm. And up until this point, Loop has suffered from two major problems. The first is, is is that it's only available within a narrow context. So it started off in Teams, uh, and then it was in Outlook for the web, and and now it's rolling out to Outlook, and and we're going to see it pretty rapidly go into other mm -hmm. things like like whiteboard, for example. 
And then you've got the loop components themselves. So I'll give you an example. The loop components within Teams goes into a different folder of the loop components in Outlook, and then they're both stored within inside personal storage. Mm. But even worse than that, you know, if you create like 50 loop components, how do you actually manage them? And there was not no, you know, kind of no way in order to be able to manage them. And that loop mm. app is going to be kind of like the big missing part. You're going to have an app to manage all of your loop components within that. And as it surfaces across all of the different and, you know, kind of applications, you'll probably see it kind of and and it raises does raise questions though. I mean, you know, the, the UX and, and, and the UI and, and this kind of idea of yeah. CI, CX and continuous improvement. But at mm -hmm. what point did Microsoft release these things? I would say that the loop itself was quite underdeveloped. It's nearly been around for a year, but you know, just the components in Microsoft Teams, we were getting a lot of kickback on that in the sessions that we were doing. Yeah, we wait and see, all right. <laughs> All right, good. So well, look, I think what we'll do, I think we're coming up to or in fact, it's just gone past uh, five o'clock here. So I think uh, let's just take a couple of minutes uh, before we kind of watch uh, watch the session on, you know, on, on governance, right? <laughs> so um, if I go back, you know, like this is a session that was uh, delivered by uh, Karwana Kitamo and John Krushak um, around all the things. And this story around governance is, I mean, it's been there from day one, right? You know, whether it's SharePoint or Teams. So um, very interesting session. And certainly when I, the organizations I work with, tenant to tenant migrations or even file share to SharePoint, and even they're still using SharePoint, that governance is still a changing story. So it's never a activity as such, but yeah, I think so this is the session about that. And also I think it's a chance to at least experience with all the announcements and everything else that we're hearing and what's gonna come, how does that kind of hopefully prepare you to make sure that at least your governance story, it's still good uh, and still requires attention. So we'll kind of just take a couple of minutes. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, you amazing folks in a governance session at the end of the day of Microsoft Ignite. Yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. And I want to say a huge shout out to the folks joining us online. This is a truly hybrid blended audience and we are happy to be here. So my name is Karawana Gatimu and I'm here. Uh, John Grushek. <laughs> He's here. He's here. Absolutely. John and I are going to take you through a little bit of a different approach to talking about Microsoft 365 governance. Uh, to be fair, this is a for our workshop, right? But what we're going to try to do is have a lot of time for demonstrations, for your questions, and highlighting the core concepts and new information. So we're going to try to just get all that in there together so that uh, you can uh, have the information that you need, but also give you some resources where you can follow up and then continue to ask your questions in the community. Um, Microsoft 365 governance is not the most lightweight of topics, and so we want to make sure you get some of that essential information. Uh, as Rick mentioned at the top, for anybody online, but also here in the room, please use this uh, particular uh, uh, content, this uh, QR code here, so that you can get your questions in the queue. We'll try to answer as many of them as we possibly can. I want to land a concept that's really important and for totally everyone in this room before we go any further. Good governance precedes great adoption. This is really important. If you are thinking about uh, how are we going to get people to use it or, oh, maybe too many people are using it or I I'm just concerned about who's using what when, that's because your governance isn't in order. Right. And so even though this may not, this is clearly a popular topic for all of you, but maybe in your organizations, when you bring up the word governance, you start to hear people groan. They sneak out of your meetings. They take a cookie and run. They sign off. All of a sudden they stop being on video. You ever notice that in an online meeting, people turn off their video when certain topics come up. Okay. That's because they associate governance with difficulty and pain. We want to change that. Governance is about having the right guardrails and about freeing people in the right context. Context. So satisfied users and happy self-service IT manageability is what our objective is. And I invite all of you to help us change the brand of governance uh, all around the world to something that is not the thing everyone runs from. 
please help me with that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, you're going to need this. Take a picture of this or take a screenshot online, ak.ms teamwork governance. This is a, a reference documentation page that you will need for the future because as we add new policies, new workloads, new services, this is where we do the updates, right? And as we do AMAs on this topic in our IT pro community, um, we always refer back to this. So please make sure you use this. Uh, John and I both publish things there. We, we overview it and, and make sure everybody is, is copacetic with it. All right. Um, how many of you here consider yourself IT pros or you're, you're an IT administrator of a Microsoft 365 tenant? Okay. All right, good. And I know you folks online are as well. I'm not forgetting about you in any way, but there's some other people here in the room as well. And it's really important to think about collaboration governance, not governance of Teams or SharePoint or whatever, right? It's all got to move together, especially the more that we integrate things with the Microsoft 365 app, with Microsoft Teams. There's so much that's happening in the service nowadays that you need to have a more broad-based governance strategy all up that you implement implement in phases. One of the biggest mistakes I ever saw a customer make was that they went from no governance to complete lockdown control in literally 30 days. That is a surefire way to get people sending documents offline, carrying around little USB sticks, using unauthorized software, um, you know, and texting stuff on some of our competitors who I won't mention that where you don't want your corporate data, right? If you don't do governance right, you will push people to breach your security because they're trying to get something done. That's why it's important to have smart governance, right, in these in this particular sort of way. Um, you know, there are some goals around file sharing, shared data and process automation, communications and digital experience, and knowledge sharing. These are the containers of the kind of teamwork governance that you need to architect. One of the fundamental foundational units of this is the Microsoft 365 group. Right. Microsoft 365 groups, it's a membership service. Yes, I know, and I'm sorry, we first launched it as O365 groups. It's a collaboration experience. Um, I realize that we did that to all of you. I'm sorry, I'll apologize <laughs> on behalf of Microsoft. Um, we were just trying to try out new things then, okay? But now what it really is, is behind the scenes is that membership service that grants people access to resources, whether it's a Power BI dashboard or a team in Teams. And so if you're not thinking of your Microsoft 365 groups in that way, I invite you to do so because without doing that, you're going to do a lot of hard work in the governance department. But that is the cornerstone of how you're going to craft these different types of collaboration experiences. Right? And so you want to think about those group identities being in Azure Active Directory. Um, and of course, this is the cloud-based version. Obviously, if you have on-prem AD, you'll be you know, doing some syncing and there's some work to do there. But nonetheless, that group experience is populated into the app of choice and that long list of apps keeps growing. That is an old list of icons. There's probably 15 more by now. All right, um, so, but let's really talk about quickly what's changed. So that's all what you may have already known or maybe not about Microsoft 365 governance. What's different now, however, is the fact that you are governing people not in your physical environment. You are governing people's machines when they're calling in from home and working remotely. Uh, the hybrid work scenarios are here to stay. And while some organizations are requiring people come back to work, many, many more are not. And so the idea of having the membership right, having identity right, and being able to support people on whatever device they may be using, I have my Duro, I have my iPhone, but both are secure. That requires the broader set of Microsoft technologies, Endpoint Manager, Intune, these other components, right? And so this is why you do it in phases. Maybe the first thing you do is make sure your N365 group governance is in order and you start there and then you have people enroll their devices and then you make sure you have healthy devices uh, and then you evolve to zero trust, right? But it's a journey. So don't leave this session thinking that, oh, you're going to go and, and turn all this on and make this all work in like a couple of minutes. It, it's not true, right? It's going to be a journey. And I think John and I can attest to that. Um, so think about how you're governing folks who are in a different or a same place who are working at the same time or a different time. 
Right. Even something as simple as the way you name your Microsoft 365 groups and how they show up in the list can make or break your governance and collaboration experience. Um, and so again, I, uh, list naming, group naming is a pet peeve of mine <laughs> because, you know, I understand everybody wants prefixes that attach to department names, but please stop doing that. Please, please stop doing that um, because you can't immediately see and understand what it is as a human, right? So it's all about people first. Okay, we're going to, this is my last slide before I really talk about, um, hang on one second, what happened to my... Okay, well, there's a triangle on there, so you're going to have to take my word for it that there's actually a triangle. It doesn't seem to be showing on my, um, oh, there, you're seeing it, but just not over here. Great. Okay. That was a test to see if I was paying attention to my own slide. Um, so the, the idea that you need to have different types of governance at different levels in the organization is another important concept. And this is my last slide before we hop into some demonstrations and take some questions, but these things coping with people in different locations, understanding the full Microsoft stack, and having policies at different levels of collaboration experiences are really the, the foundational elements of being able to craft a good strategy and then make an execution plan. So for instance, at the work group level, it's not as important to have uh, controls that control, uh, you know, how many files are uploaded or, you know, what, you know, what kind of membership is there. But you might very much want to control whether or not external guests are included, right? The guest policies you have in your organization are often different depending on the type of group you're in, right? Folks on the manufacturing floor may not ever have the ability to add a guest to a team. But if I work in marketing and I'm collaborating with vendors doing creative, then I need guests to come into that team so that I can effectively work together. Um, I need the control of shared channels in Microsoft Teams where I can choose which organizations I'm going to trust, right, and have those experiences. As you move up in the group experience to departments and divisions, and of course that company level like Viva Connections, your SharePoint home, those sorts of uh, hubs and what have you, you have more of a one-to-many. You have a very few number of people who can edit and own things and a very large amount of people who can consume information. Right, and so that sort of um, model is one of the things that we're trying to improve because quite frankly, it's been pretty difficult to keep alignment in the group membership between the SharePoint sites and the teams. And then what if you add an app in there, right? It just gets super complicated and it hasn't been the easiest thing in the world to manage. So we know that, we've heard that feedback. I've lived that even just as a program manager inside Microsoft. Um, so I can tell you that we are doing some work to streamline that and communications, which is the whole point of Viva Amplify, which we announced here at the show. But my, my key thing here to, to land with all of you is have different policies for different types of experiences in your Microsoft 365 tenant. One size does not fit all. Uh, and you will make happy people and have good adoption if you automate as much of this as possible. So I wanted to land all of that. And now I want to turn it over to John, who's going to show us how some of this actually works, right? Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you, John. Um, and one of the things I love is uh, we probably don't get to work together enough as much as we maybe like to, but all the key points you hit on uh, resonate super deeply with me uh, when we talk about governance. And one of the things is uh, that you hit on is frictionless, right? Mm -hmm. Is and I'm going to start with the security angle of this because, you know, governance goes across many spectrums, but one of them is this idea of work from anywhere, work from any device. Um, years ago when Ignite was in Orlando, uh, some of you might not know this, but as soon as that Ignite ended, uh, we went on usually a 15 to 20 uh, roadshow tour. And everyone had the expectation is we need to keep working on our content. We need to be working like we're sitting in Redmond, uh, wherever we are. And so that was always an expectation. I'm sure many of you uh, pre-pandemic had that same expectation of global sales forces or regional sales forces. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, access governance. And one of the first things, um, since there's probably a range of different hats being worn here from uh, different admin sides, uh, the first is uh, the number one thing is please set up MFA. Please set up multi-factor authentication. Yes. Uh, sorry to hit an elephant in the room, but uh, it is starting to being baked into cyber insurance policies, right? And so please. It's a very easy thing to do, and it starts to get this general hygiene with end users that it's an expectation. You can make it very frictionless uh, using the Authenticator app or whatever your kind of tooling is, but please, 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 uh, we're going to sound like we're beating a dead horse, but it is. Uh, MFA, please, is the very first level of access governance that you should have set up. Even if you're internal, even if you're sitting on site and you're coming from a corporate IP address, 
Uh, if I'm accessing sensitive uh, projects that we were about to announce as part of Ignite, we're probably having labeling on there. We're having access policies. You need MFA that you want to pull in. So um, hopping into some demos to zoom in. Uh, the first thing uh, that we'll talk about is we'll look at a conditional access policy. We'll skip over MFA, but um, just quick show of hands uh, for people in the room. Uh, how many of you do use conditional access or some type of access? Oh, look at that. Look at that. And I'm going to hope that two people <laughs> at home are raising your hands <laughs> at your workstation at home. That's fantastic. Absolutely. And so uh, I won't do a whole lot of uh, stuff here because you're talking about it, uh, or excuse me, uh, we're uh, using high risk, or excuse me, we're using high usage, uh, but risk based conditional access is one thing. Uh, I'm just showing a very brief demo here. As Carawana mentioned, this is probably a five hour workshop, but uh, in general, start to assign risk, and this is all based on your internal organization, right? IP changes. Um, uh, as simple as, are you coming from a secure device? At Microsoft, we get to use our personal devices and we use mobile application management. So MSIT is managing the applications. We could still keep our personal stuff on there, uh, but everything we do is still using MFA. Essentially, anytime we're trying to access corporate materials, uh, but that frictionless is key because I wanna be able to use Teams naturally and I can ping and do everything naturally. Uh, but when we start to access you know, sensitive SharePoint sites or other sensitive materials, uh, we probably wanna push an MFA and we wanna do additional checks on that device. Another great thing that I can't show off here, but that has been baked into part of conditional access is continuous access evaluation. How many of you, well, wanna be inclusive of everyone online, so we'll say everyone knows uh, about CAE, but we're able to provide checks uh, in more real time, right? So we can assess if those properties changed because we wanna uh, trust that all of our end users are uh, not malicious, but sometimes we do get breaches or we have things going on in the organization that we wanna make sure that our security investments are looking out for. And so one of those things is, is someone quickly changing their IP address, right? Maybe they're uh, trying to spoof who they are and we uh, are able to sense that this person said they were in the US and also now we see an IP address coming from somewhere that is not remotely possible. We've identified that that is not uh, that uh, identity. So, um, and I could probably drain this, but uh, from a sign in risk level as well, we'll take a look here, um, high, medium, low, uh, no risk at all. You can assign these on an application basis, or one of the things we see customers do is apply these to the normal apps you're pushing out. Outlook, SharePoint, Yammer, Teams, um, and depending on how you collaborate, maybe you need to increase permissions on some of those, maybe you don't, but in general, we see typically Outlook, Teams, SharePoint, Yammer managed together. And so uh, if you've already created those policies, maybe you uh, haven't uh, started rolling out Teams yet, but you had this governance in place, Easy enough as you go through and go through this wizard, you're just gonna have a checkbox for Teams. So uh, a lot of the governance uh, is when it comes from the security identity side is building on what you've already set up for things like exchange and workloads. Uh, so we wanna make sure, again, conditional access, I was glad to see the hands here so we can move on to the next item, uh, but that is a very big thing because uh, again, it even uh, includes on-premises stuff. Uh, if you're accessing sensitive materials, we just want to validate that identity and then we want to let that continuous access evaluation continually assessing that that identity is true uh, and that it is a trusted identity. And as John goes on to the next topic, I also want to encourage you that um, if you are new to this or if you want to try some of these things out, um, if you know, one of the big things that I've had in my kind of back pocket all this time is my own tenant. Right, even with a lower level license, like an E3 or something, get your own tenant so you can go in and play and look at these settings and understand what's available uh, before you are playing around or do, trying to do work in your production tenant at the office. Right? Now, obviously, some things don't work the same when it's just you as a user, but still, it gives you something to get that hands on keyboard experience in many cases, especially with some of the baseline capabilities that we're talking about. So, if you don't have your own dev or test tenant, I highly recommend investing in that um, or, or have your organization actually have uh, a dev a tenant uh, that's available to you. I know at Microsoft we don't make it 100% easy when it comes to tenant to tenant work like that, but it is something that we as IT professionals need to embrace and create in our own uh, organizations. Fantastic tip, yes. I, I've worked with customers that do have pre-prod tenants and everything gets scaled out there, especially if you're in a regulated industry. Uh, maybe yeah. you can't use certain preview features or you can't just roll things out uh, and I would double down. Uh, I have about five tenants I maintain all with different things going on in them based on uh, demos like this. 
I will echo that if you want to, you know, create conversation, you spend a lot of lonely hours talking with yourself in different personas, but uh, <laughs> it can be fun when you're traveling. So um, as we move on to access governance, uh, the next is uh, working with other organizations, right? This is a, a very common expectation that whether you have partners, vendors, uh, you know, legal departments that are outside the group, uh, working cross-tenant. And so we won't do a whole deep dive on this because this, again, is probably a, a 12-hour session when you talk about external access. But uh, the first thing is, is you know, how you want to work with cross-tenant organizations. And so this is um, essentially shared channels. So hopefully you saw that announcement. Uh, you've maybe been in the public preview when that started. And we uh, GA'd it, I believe, July of this year was the official date. Um, and so shared channels are really a great next step when we talk about uh, in any sort of collaboration um, being able to keep things inside of that secure container without having to do tenant switching inside the team's tenant, which we know can be uh, somewhat burdensome uh, depending on how you are collaborating. You want to have everything in line. And so this is kind of one of the first steps. And again, your organization will have to determine how you want to work and what your kind of allow and deny list look like uh, for other partner organizations. So in general, if you haven't seen the screen and you do work within the Azure Active Directory Center uh, or you have an identity team, uh, this should be a page that you're going through and kind of assessing uh, how essentially your inbound, outbound, and tenant restrictions are going to work. Uh, you see down here at the bottom, uh, I don't have a very inclusive environment here. I block everything, right? And this is just an example for what a super uh, kind of strict and lockdown environment would look like. But as we hop over to the next section here uh, of external collaboration, this is where we start to get into how we're going to manage guests. And one thing I do want to relate here is inside the Teams Admin Center, which I can hop to, there's something called uh, what we call federated access with other organizations and guest access. Those are actually powered through here in Azure Active Directory, their identity models. And so this is where you're going to manage things. And so here we talk about how we want to manage guests, who can invite guests, um, guest user access restrictions, invite restrictions, whether we want to enable uh, self-service user flows. And this is one that I think every customer we talk to probably has a different way they want to handle this, yeah. uh, including Microsoft, right? Uh, we do are fairly strict to how guests get onboarded um, and how they're, uh, what type of access level they're able to have. And so this is another area that uh, I love that you mentioned, sit down with a team of people. This is not something that you want to reactively throw out there and think it's going to be solved. This is something that you should have stakeholders from uh, as many groups as needed. I realize too many cooks in the kitchen could become a problem, but uh, you want to have all of your key decision makers in here that are uh, on SecOps teams, compliance, maybe even legal that you need to consult with. How are you going to allow outside users in? Uh, because that is a key determinant in how you uh, kind of have open collaboration. And the other piece of that that I'll add is, yes, you want IT, SecOps, legal, all, all those folks at the table, but please also have your sales and marketing leaders, have your business leaders at that table as well. It's very important that these types of policies be a joint decision. Because no, there is a natural tension that is going to come between many business leaders who just want things to be open and IT professionals and legal folks and security who want everything to be closed. The actual way is the middle way, right? It's where you have these uh, policies created by the risk level of the data, right? There are certain teams inside Microsoft that don't allow external guests, period. And there's others that do because they are labeled appropriately. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. But just make sure that you bring these folks together with an understanding that it's not either or. Both groups can feel confident that the most uh, sensitive data can be protected and be ring fenced, if you will. And then data where it's really better for the business to have more fluidity and uh, with you know access for external people that can also be created. Um, the last thing I'm going to say about that is early on in my career, before I joined Microsoft, one of the first articles I wrote was how to build a governance committee. And, the, and most of that article is still valid 15 years later. But what I would change is I wouldn't call it a governance committee, <laughs> right? Bring together people around architecting collaboration experience or empowering our business. Like use different words, I beg of you, um, because you will get more attention and you will get more traction on making these very important decisions and you'll get more partnership from people across your business. That was perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so what does this look like? We talked about, again, this is a, a fairly uh, easy to, to digest page, but what that starts to lead into is I'll hop into the Teams Admin Center dashboard here. And that's the first thing that we're gonna take a look at is how we manage our uh, collaboration. So the first thing I talked about was uh, federation. Uh, external access is what it's actually called by in the identity model behind the scenes. And so external access is that domain-domain collaboration. 
Uh, and in most cases, uh, you're going to have this on by default. You're going to be able to work with any organization. Uh, and that's typically how Microsoft works as well, as we actually are constantly working. Uh, sorry, I use ping, but I am message via Teams um, with customers, yeah. uh, with analysts, with community experts or MVPs, uh, whoever it may be. Uh, and so external access is a key part of working together. Uh, but depending on your organization, uh, depending on your industry, uh, you may have different regulations here. And so this is one of the key things is this drop down menu here, uh, whether you're going to allow all external domains, specific external domains, or you can then move to block, block all or block specific external domains. Again, I'm not going to give away any uh, MSIT secrets, so I'll, I'll use Contoso organization here. Uh, but in Contoso organization, we're an open, uh, an open book, right? We spend a lot of time working with different partners, different communities, whatever it may be. And so we have allow external domains and we have our, our uh, additional security compliance measures in place, things like uh, data loss prevention, communication compliance that we can monitor for data leaks, but we have a very open uh, collaboration environment. And so uh, this is one of the key things. Again, it's a very easy drop down, a very simplified demo, uh, but this is really another key. Uh, I like what you said, don't always have to use governance. Uh, use different terms here, but this is one of the key decisions you'll have to talk through is how are we going to work with other organizations? Maybe to start, you only want to allow certain domains that you work with uh, and block everyone else. This is a decision that we can't stand up here and make for your organization. This is something you'll want to talk about. Uh, scrolling down, you see the other kind of key thing is uh, whether you're going to allow communication with Skype users. But the next area we move to is guest access. And so uh, in most organizations, you're going to uh, have a need to bring on guests into your organization to be able to access things like planner uh, or other parts of the team that you want to share resources in. Uh, and so this is exactly how you're going to be able to manage guests inside the team's admin center. Again, the identity part is managed inside of Azure Active Directory, that previous page I showed you. But this is going to be specific to teams. And there's a fairly, uh, I don't want to say simplified, but a very uh, upfront, uh, different set of controls that you can set here for how guests are going to have a collaboration experience inside of your environment. So uh, for instance, uh, most are default left on and most uh, customers I work with leave the majority of these on, but maybe you want to say that, hey, uh, guests can't edit their messages once they sent. Uh, it's a compliance issue, so we could turn that off. And another one would be something, uh, what we call our fun settings, which is one of my favorite things we have in the admin center, uh, but is, uh, you know, Giphy and conversations, uh, the content rating, uh, maybe you want to say it's very strict. We want to say that, you know what, for right now, we don't use memes, we don't use stickers. Uh, again, very simplified overview here, but these are all internal decisions that you want to figure out how you're going to work with your organization, uh, work with your department leads, marketing experts, uh, legal experts, whoever it may be, understanding what type of access guests have, because once you roll this out, you start on, you have to understand that a guest in your environment um, is someone you don't necessarily know. You don't understand what they may be doing. And so uh, it is key to have your, your kind of restrictions and, and things set up in place. Otherwise, you'll be working on identifying who are the good guests, who are overstayed their welcome, how do we start to get these people out? Right. And it's always wise to have people take ownership. One of the best campaigns I think we ever rolled out in MSIT, um, Microsoft IT, was around um, each employee has an accountability for security. It's not just IT or the security department. Everybody has an accountability for keeping our data safe. And so we've done things like ask uh, site and team owners to review view the guests that have access in that team on a quarterly basis. It doesn't take more than a couple of minutes, but it, it makes people participate in the process of securing data, right? And it takes that decision out of IT's department, right? And so if you don't renew people, then they will be automatically renewed. But actually we rolled that process out over the process of a year. First, we got people used to reviewing their guests that they had already granted access to. Then we got them used to the fact that if they didn't go in and grant access, why that people would be removed. And we did it in a progressive process. So engage your end users, and especially people who are the owners of Teams, owners of SharePoint sites and what have you, and applications as well, to take that sense of ownership about who is accessing that data. Because IT alone or security alone will never be able to secure everything. It's just not humanly possible. So we have to engage an army of educated end users, uh, you know, about this. Absolutely. Uh, I, I love that because you really do. And the last thing I'll quickly show on the uh, Teams Admin Center side, um, I realize many of you um, may have so many teams when this page loads, it's not even feasible to really understand it. Uh, but what I do like to say is there's actually some very good things here when you go to the Manage Teams page inside Teams Admin Center that I like to look at. Privacy. 
And then also as I scroll over here, it will let you know if there's a sensitivity label applied to me. Those are teams that I'm typically trying to look at from a hygiene perspective to understand what type of guests are in there. Are, uh, are the roles assigned properly? So this is actually one of the coolest things I think that is good for insights. Again, understand if your organization has uh, 100,000 teams. A little more uh, daunting to look at, but again, I think privacy and sensitivity label here are two very quick, easy ways to identify uh, maybe more sensitive based teams or content that you want to do a double click in or keep kind of uh, taking a look at. All right. And also these things can be set up at the beginning. Now I know some customers have wanted to do things like either a Power App or a Microsoft form before people are able to provision teams or SharePoint sites or what have you, because you're trying to gather more information, things of that nature. I understand why you want to do that. And we also don't let you do much to um, alter that provisioning experience. But what I will say is if you take advantage of some of the capabilities of Microsoft 365, you may not have to do that because you can have group membership be the thing that allows people to provision teams. And that, that provisioning experience can be altered with the addition of data labels and privacy elements added to it at provisioning. And so um, one of the things that you'll find on the teamwork governance page, but also in this deck, which will make sure it gets attached to the digital experience um, is instructions on how to do that. We have many customers that we work with, we've guided them into customizing that provisioning experience because the worst thing that you can do is make someone wait for their team. Because if they have to wait for that team more than the time it takes us to actually create it, um, they will go find another way to get work done. And you've already created a breach in your security by not meeting their needs when they needed it. So we really ask you to take a look at the capabilities of Microsoft 365 Admin Center of Azure Active Directory admin capabilities so that you can customize that experience in ways that again at the work group and department level, like those memberships that people get when they become an employee in your company, also set up policies for what collaboration experiences they can use. This becomes even more important as we think about new workloads, but I wanted to make sure. Did you want to do another one here? Um, no, we'll transition into some broad data governance. So you can, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to, because there's a, there was a question online that I wanted to address, and it's a perfect role into some of the new workloads. Um, has anybody out there tried Microsoft Loop? Yet a couple of people. Yeah, you have some folks out there. Okay, and I apologize. I keep having people raise their hands in the room. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to include the folks online as well. Um, but you know, so Microsoft Loop, I want you to think of that as a collaborative uh, container that's portable, right? You basically a loop allows you to make a task list, a table, or just a checklist of, of pieces of information, and you can use it in Teams chat, you can use it in Outlook and email, you can use it on a web page that's coming soon. Right, but the thing is that that is governed essentially by OneDrive, right? That's why it's important you have good governance policies in place for OneDrive and SharePoint and what have you, because we are going to keep delivering more features that leverage that infrastructure, the data governance, the labeling, um, the, ex uh, the retention policies and things of that nature are going to be um, continuing to expand across Microsoft 365. We have a tremendous investment in that in the SharePoint space, in the Microsoft Syntax space and others, and in the admin centers. So when you think about Loop and Viva and these things, which are pretty new, actually they're extremely new, um, they may not have all those capabilities now, but neither did Teams when it launched. So two years from now, Loop is definitely going to have all of those capabilities. So you have the time to think about how you're integrating them into your system. The second piece of that is about going back to your guest access. The question was about um, what governs the data if a guest is in a team, essentially, uh, and what happens when there's two com uh, you know, competing retention policies or what have you. This goes directly to your collaboration experience. So one of the mistakes I'll say we made when we first launched Teams inside Microsoft is we let our field salespeople make Teams inside our tenant and invite all the customers. Now, that's not a bad thing in theory, but oftentimes the data that's there isn't actually Microsoft's. It isn't ours to govern. It's the customer's data. It's the customer's information. So a better way to have done that would have been to have the customers make the team and invite us right, rather than the other way around. So because the, the organization that owns the team, those are the policies that are going to follow that data and that guest membership, 
right? So I'm still, I still have them. I'm still a member of like, you know, five different, like you would know their names, like customer teams that are on our tenant. But every time I'm in there, I cringe a little bit because they really shouldn't be there. They should be in the customer space. But we didn't know that at the beginning. So now all of you have that opportunity. You have maybe sales organizations that want to collaborate with customers and they should. If that customer's not using Teams, then fine. That's not a problem. Make them on your tenant, but then you have policies that surround the use of that particular team. Um, and, and that way you have uh, customer experiences that are governed, but also really fast to be able to make decisions, right? You can be on chat with them. You can share a file easily, that sort of thing. Um, and those files should live in SharePoint, not in your OneDrive, not in your sales agent's OneDrive. That's not where they go. They go in the team, in the SharePoint, please. <laughs> John's thumb drive. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, John's <laughs> thumb drive, not the place to store the corporate data. Okay, yeah, yeah speaking of data loss prevention. Yeah, no, I, I love that. <laughs> that was um, the human element of it. Um, and especially, yeah, um, as a rule of thumb, please don't take this as the de facto law. Uh, as a rule of thumb, host tenant is going to be the governance of the data. So yes. retention, sensitivity, uh, again, always read the detailed documentation for the service that you're working on. But in general, we think of if we're in a host tenant, they're the one that's controlling the data um, and having to keep the retention policies, whatever it may be associated. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple uh, high level uh, security items. This is not necessarily a security session, but you can't really talk about governance without talking about how we're going to govern data. So, uh, and I love that you talked about some of the features that will be coming to loop because exactly Teams is one of these that DLP or data loss prevention uh, was not available for uh, initially. Something that we started to integrate right after Teams was out. Uh, but one of the cool things was for customers, we were able to go and say, hey, those DLP policies and rules that you have set up in place for Exchange and SharePoint, we just introduced a new checkbox for Teams. You don't have to go and you don't have to go and, and have a total reinvention brainstorming session on how do we manage teams or anything like that. If it's as simple for your organization as, hey, we want to govern it the same as we would SharePoint, which generally happens a lot, yeah. it's a checkbox. And um, in my opinion, it's always great when we can do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so um, here again, I'm not going to go through all the uh, individual policies. We have a great preset. Uh, if I went and created a new policy here, uh, it would allow us to uh, pre-select from categories, so things like uh, privacy or in the information space, uh, healthcare, depending on, again, regional space. So these are not U.S. oriented. These are global oriented policies that we've worked with customers, uh, large and small, understanding what are the most common policies you set up. Uh, but one of my favorite things to do if you're ever bored for like three hours is create a custom DLP policy. <laughs> you could do a lot of really cool things where you're actually defining the sub-level rules of everything that happens. You can allow uh, the granular level controls about whether an end user, when the pop-up says that, hey, you have, uh, you've sent something that is blocked, you can control that complete message in itself too. Um, and what I'm alluding to is I will go over here and take a look at a chat with Megan Bowen. Uh, and you'll see here that I sent a credit card. I was trying to order some lunch and I just didn't think about it. And I was like, hey, here's my credit card information. Order those pizzas, let's get going. Not a good idea to share credit card information, right? It's also not a good idea to share credit card information in a SharePoint, or excuse me, a Word doc with a ton of files so we can uh, be able to assess through it there. So this is a very just uh, quick, obvious uh, example of sharing something through DLP that it's going to catch. And then we can click on it. And here it's going to let the end user know why it was blocked. And we do feel this is extremely important. We want to let the end user know like, hey, you didn't commit a violation. You're not in trouble. We just want to let you know that this is material that shouldn't be shared. Some cases you might want to actually allow an overwrite here, right? Uh, and that is something that again, we get into those really fun creative rules that you can customize yourself that you can decide how your organization works. Uh, in this case for credit cards, I don't want my Contoso user sharing it. So I'm going to let it uh, be blocked. And if we feel like there's an error here or maybe that this uh, was a uh, you know rare mismatch that it thought it was a credit card and it wasn't, we can have it reported. It can go to the proper uh, authorities is a strong word, but the proper admins to be able yes. to triage this and take a look and say, oh, okay, this is what's going on because uh, permissions is always very important too. And who's able to access data like this when it's data governance, uh, communication compliance, et cetera. We want to make sure that we have the right roles and permissions that are able to uh, make the right assessment. So uh, again, very quick and, and kind of dirty view of, uh, of DLP, but um, it is something that again, works across your spectrum of Microsoft 365. It is not unique to Teams, to Exchange, to SharePoint, to, to Yammer or anywhere else. 
uh, in the sense that it's supposed to work across your ecosystem. Correct, correct. Now, of course, we're doing all of this fun stuff in a demonstration tenant, which means the perf is awesome. We can hop open all of the lists. There's no like waiting and going getting coffee because there's 100,000 teams in your tenant. Um, so one of the skills that you need to have in this area, especially if you work in a larger organization, is PowerShell. You need PowerShell scripting capabilities. You need to understand the way PowerShell works. And so for me, you know, I, I, I don't know how you all feel about this, but you know, people talk a lot about low code, no code, and your pro developers and what have you. Um, I think some of the pro PowerShell scripts I've seen in my time are absolutely code as far as I'm concerned. They are complicated, they have complicated syntax, and we have a community where you can learn some of the ins and outs of that, but you do need to configure it on your machine. You do have to be an admin of that tenant to, to be able to install those modules. This is another really good reason to have a, a pre-prod or a dev uh, tenant that you can practice your scripting skills on. And I'm bringing that up also because the question that someone is asking uh, is, will these B2B guest configurations be exposed for management via the Graph API? And most things you do in the Graph API, you often do in scripting. And so I'm going to let you answer that question or we can share whatever you, you want. Ahead, yeah. Okay, so... Um, you know, the Graph API continues to evolve. Some of the capabilities are there, but I, to be honest, I believe that some of the um, flags that you need to control some of those capabilities are missing. Um, and so, you know, we continue to put more and more into the Graph API because it is the center of gravity. Uh, you know, it's the substrate, the place where all data in Microsoft 365 and beyond exists. Uh, and so if it's not there today, it will be in the future. But I actually believe some of these capabilities um, that we can automate, and that goes to automating user onboarding or guest onboarding. Um, there's also also some lovely things called packages inside of Azure um, Active Directory that also allows you to write uh, additional scripts. And uh, I've seen many organizations also use Power Automate in their user onboarding process or their team's de uh, deployment process. So um, there are ways to do this. So if you're looking to automate things, the answer is yes. Exactly where and how depends on your scenario and which policy or um, characteristic you're trying to get to in Graph API. I love it. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm being very mindful of time, and thank you, Marcus, for the question. Um, yes. So this is the last, um, you know, kind of demo screen I'm going to show here is uh, around sensitivity labels, and this again is another item that goes across. Started in uh, Office apps, you know, uh, applying a sensitivity label to a document, uh, functional spec, or whatever it may be, and this is something that was widely embraced by our community, our customers, yes. and they uh, have continually told us to build this out more and more and more and more, uh, and so that's what we've done. And so uh, I think it was about a year, a year and a half ago, we introduced sensitivity labels into Teams. And so uh, you can go through here, you can create a sensitivity label and it's part of the, uh, the menu, which I won't do, I'll show you the end user view. Uh, you had this new drop down that included sites, groups, and then Microsoft Teams. And within Teams, you can help define privacy limits like guests, which is one of probably the most key assets, is when I apply a sensitivity label when creating a team, which I'll show you right here, is we can actually limit uh, who's able to join that team when we apply that label. So again, same familiar labels that you're applying to a document or uh, an email even perhaps, like highly confidential, confidential are always the generic ones that we use, but within Microsoft, we have things, you know, Microsoft confidential, highly confidential. Um, typically, organizations make these very customized based on how their org works. Um, but the nice thing is, again, we don't want to reinvent labels. We don't want to have a bunch of different things that end users have to see and try and figure out what does this actually mean. We want consistency. And so if you are one of those orgs that has the, kind of the key area of five to ten labels, when someone goes to create a new team, they can select a privacy level, private, public, org-wide, or they can use a pre-existing sensitivity label that you've created back from the, uh, the old days of the Office apps, and you can apply it directly to the team. And once you select this label, it's automatically going to enforce that privacy policy, right? So anything Project Cortana, I can spin that team up. It's going to have the sensitivity label associated uh, with this team, uh, and it will make it only private. And so um, what that looks like from an uh, end user view here is I always have to find the right team, but it's going to be up here in your right-hand column of uh, that the team has a sensitivity label applied to it. And I'm 
Now I'm going to have to click through a bunch of them. But uh, instead of wasting time doing that, what I'm going to say is sensitivity labels are something that we're continuing to invest in. Uh, one of the recent things we did about six months ago or a year ago was we can actually have retention labels triggered off of sensitivity labels. So that coupling together there. We understood from customers that they were typically applying both. And so again, leveraging that automation, that works smarter, not harder. Uh, and so uh, even if you are uh, an E3 customer and you're using manual classifications of sensitivity labels, still a very key thing to start introducing to your organization, teaching them and understanding. Maybe you start with one label only, confidential, right? That's totally okay. Even if you're a 100,000 seat organization, you haven't started it yet. It's better to start with a small number of labels, and I'd love your opinion on this, but start small, things that people can yes. understand, understand how to actually apply them. Otherwise, they're just not going to do so. Exactly. Any drop down that has more than a, you know a few choices, people are just going to ignore. We learned this from all the way back when we were configuring PC docs instances back in the day in the legal industry, right? So people have this desire. People like myself want to capture a lot of information, have a lot of fields. People won't fill it out. They'll just go away, right? So if you're formed, you know, or you're provisioning, you know, uh, instance tries to gather too much information. Uh, I think it's. I think it's. 17 seconds i forgot the data point now but we actually you know have the number of seconds that it takes to lose someone <laughs> and it's not very long right so i love the idea of starting small and building on from there because it goes back to this best practice of involving your users and making sure to secure the data using the automation capabilities so a lot of the things that john just showed you people were building into forms Right, you don't have to build it into the form. You can configure it right in Microsoft 365. Let us have the onus of maintaining that system for you, right? Save your custom coding time for things that actually matter to your business and let us handle the governance policies and capabilities. You just have to configure and deploy them uh, and then continue to give us feedback on what else you need us to build, right? Um, you know, governance is an ever evolving space. And the collaboration experience, having a successful collaboration experience is also really important. I'm going to flip back. Let's flip back to the deck, yep. to the teamwork governance slide. So once again, I want you to visit this documentation, but also visit the Microsoft 365 community. Um, you can find that at aka.ms Microsoft community. That's our new front door we just launched at the show this week. But that's a group of uh, IT pros, admins, and developers, people who know how to do PowerShell. Uh, Vesa Junovanen runs that community. He is spectacular. They have weekly calls. They have demonstrations. They have videos. Anything that you want to learn about this topic and so much more you can find there. You can also find it on Microsoft Learn, right? And so one of the things that we're trying to do better is help guide you through the phases of this with more, um, in a bit more smooth of a way. So we're continuing to invest in Microsoft Learn and our documentation around this. But don't let governance be the bane of your user adoption. Uh, make sure that you're protecting your data and making relationships with the other business leaders in your organization. Um, IT pros are superheroes. Uh, they really are. We're the ones who kept the lights on uh, in many respects uh, during the beginning of the pandemic. We're the ones who enable people to be successful. We just want to do it in secure ways. So now our challenge is to communicate with those business leaders a little bit differently so that they can understand uh, the tremendous asset that all of you are uh, in making sure that they have a great business. So. I really appreciate, you know, so many people here and online coming to this session um, at the end of the day. We really hope you had a fantastic Ignite, this wonderful experiment of a hybrid show. Um, and, you know, I hope that you did. And, and please, I hope to see you out in the community. Feel free to continue to ask us questions. John and I are out there all the time. This is one of our favorite subjects and just really very much appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Hey, wow. Okay, that was quite a lot to take in. <laughs> but for some of us, that might be familiar in terms of uh, the governance workflows we go. So I think, look, uh, really appreciate for, for everyone. I think if there's any, I, I did see some comments there. And uh, Paul, yeah, absolutely. I really I pre appreciate that because it's all about sharing and, uh, well, sharing is caring, right? So <laughs> if there's anything that, that can help, that would be great. I think I've also done a few sessions myself on external sharing and security and compliance <laughs> all the scripts are there so uh, yeah you know please do take a look at that a lot of that is still a good and relevant content so 
Good stuff. So let me go back to my slides and uh, I've just got a few links to share. But in the meantime, any questions, any thoughts, please, uh, please unmute. And that's OK. If you if you have any further thoughts afterwards, then by all means you can reach us through Twitter, LinkedIn uh, and you know one of us can try and reach out to you as well. So uh, yeah, look, I think uh, I just want to say one big thanks to to everybody uh, today and uh, especially uh, well, Dick, Chris, Alexio, Sharon, Paul for hanging around too. So, um, you know, without them, you know, we wouldn't have had had that kind of first hour of what we tried to share and kind of really unpack everything that we had that we came across at Microsoft Ignite. So uh, big thanks uh, and you know, I look forward to having you again as well. So, you know, that'll be that'd be great. Um, just you know, while we're on the subject of Microsoft Ignite and, you know, Microsoft is obviously uh, good at, you know, in terms of kind of creating this camp, uh, this kind of cloud skills challenge. So if you haven't already done so, uh, you know, these are a set of learning paths that you can participate, picking on particular themes for your work, AI, um, teamwork, uh, security and compliance, whatever that is. So I'll put those links in, in a sec on the, in the chat window, but you've got until pretty much say uh, next week, uh, 9th of November thereabouts, uh, and you can basically get yourself a free certification exam, which normally I think in UK, something like I think 130 or 140 pounds. So that might be worth uh, for you to at least, uh, you know, kind of expand and, and learn and discover your skills. Something else that is quite really good. Uh, if you haven't had a look at that, you know, do take a look because Learn Live is all about, you know, again, MVPs and other folks. They kind of walk you through through the demos uh, as well as the complementary content that you have part of the Microsoft Learn. So all that is combined in literally an on-demand session. So there are huge topics there. Uh, it's been going on for some time, so there is a past uh, kind of series in there as well. So take a look at those as well. Uh, and really, instead of just reading on Microsoft Learn website, going through, you know, topic by topic, you can actually uh, see that uh, in terms of how they're doing it uh, kind of in a, in a visual way. So that's that's really good and it's more interactive uh, to kind of absorb all the knowledge that you get. And then you've got your usual things around the Learn Community Forum and, and also, you know, MSFT QA, so the Q&A. So all those links are there. So, you know, at any time, uh, Community is a lot more accessible as well as Microsoft, the forum. So you can get your, you know, almost bet, you know, bottom dollar that you can get your answer question answered uh, as quickly as, as somebody can answer that. OK, well, with that, I'll just say, you know, thanks uh, one more time for everybody. Um, as usual, uh, those are the, the usual kind of links in there. So the this recording will be made available. Uh, uh, in a few days time, but uh, you know, if you're around in the UK and you know, especially in Manchester area, uh, you know, please do you know pop in and you know that's going to be all about Viva or Microsoft Viva itself. So you know, that's 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 a huge day. First time we're doing it. So Leslie, Sarah, Fana, and uh, a few others, Kevin McDonald, Zoe, we're all kind of together, kind of organizing this event. So uh, we'll be good to see you there. But uh, yeah, so I think if there's any questions, then you know, please do put them through now, but I'm just going to post those links in the chat now. So at least uh, you have all those good things. Thank you for having us, Shirag, and for organising this. It's been absolutely awesome. And I'm bummed that I can't make it there in November because that is going to be a fantastic event. Uh, I'm being a relatively new Viva Explorer. Uh, really looking forward to seeing what the content and comes out of it. No, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And thanks for having, you know, thanks for being here and taking the time out. So, um, yeah. Good. It'll be good to see you soon. Cool. Again, uh, yeah, thank you for hosting this, Tirek. It's uh, been a great session. It's a pleasure. So, thank uh, you. I've quite enjoyed it. Great stuff. Uh, great to have you. Well, thank you for the participation you. from those from the audience as well. Absolutely. The sure. audience. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you've learned a lot as well, because it's always difficult to try and kind of get all these things in, in what, one or two hours. So hopefully that's been of value to you. You will see as well as the links. Uh, I've put the uh, the feedback in uh, feedback link in there.